Uh, Rob Rowe had worked with the 720 team, John Solowitz, Dave Rolson, those guys had set up a, a skateboard half pipe ramp in the back here. Um, Full scale. One of the better ones I've ever seen. Ten um, foot of radius. I ten. Build it. Yeah. You ten on foot two. radius with like uh, two to three feet of straight vertical at the top drop. And they did that, and they had some of the best skateboarders in the area at the we time. We had not, um, not only the best skateboarders in the area. We had the best boarders in the world. Yeah. And, and we would they'd be there playing around. We'd videotape them, and the purpose was, you know, kind of like Walt Disney filmed Deers for Bambi. We had to film these skateboarders to understand skateboarding moves and. Uh, Will Noble was a fantastic animator, worked on that, and um, did a great job of capturing all of that. But we had a whole skateboarding ramp set up, and it became kind of like a party area. And it was really, it was really, that's right when I first started working here, and it was just incredible. You come to this place, you make video games, and in the back there's a skateboarding ramp. I mean, it was, it was, it was beautiful. If you can imagine a joystick that revolved on a circular basis that wouldn't return upright, so it just in a circle which would enable you to do the 720. If you got your speed going right, hit a curve, you can flip in the air and do this, right? Yeah. To do the move. Clax was a game which um, management approached us, um, I don't know what, in, in, in late summer and said we needed a product for, um, for the, uh, the January show in, um, in England and uh, could we do a game in a few months? <laughs> um, and so, you know, of course I said yes and then we had to go figure out what we were going to do in four months. And um, at that time Tetris had been popular, uh, Ed had done a coin op version of Tetris and Tetris had just taken off, um, and uh, so this clash was basically a following on the footsteps of uh, trying to come up with a concept that uh, played into this whole puzzle game thing that was happening at the time. I started thinking of, I started drawing just on the um, paint system I had at work, I started drawing just little shapes that, of abstract pictures that looked like puzzle games, not without any kind of restrictions on what they should do or anything. And, after, I don't know, what, a week or two of this? Right, he'd, he'd hang, the ones that he liked, he'd print out and hang up on his wall. So we had all these things that looked like games, a lot of simple primary shapes and a lot of very colorful things, and that was the inspiration. And then eventually one day, I don't know why, but I came up with, well, we could, I'm thinking about these shapes coming down, and you have to sort them and put them in piles and match colors very much like Tetris. And um, I don't know, it kind of kind of came from an idea too of, remember that Lucy show where she has to make pies and they have to hurry up and so you had to do these operations to get this thing finished and so it was it was kind of like that and I, I described it to Dave, I said I picture, I don't know, I, I think we just picked five columns for some reason, I pictured five different columns of stuff coming down and then you have a paddle and you collect it and then you could move this paddle back and forth and, and plop it in the pile and then when you had three or more of a kind it would go away and you could do verticals and diagonals and horizontal lines. And um, that's the game. And that was the game. And Dave <laughs> Dave went home on the weekend, I think on the Amiga, right? Right. And over the weekend he did a, a real crude looking just block blocks and colored things. And I remember went back, there's only one Amiga here at the time it was in the video lab and he loaded up in the video lab and, and we were able to play it after I got a <laughs> prototype going on a weekend in Amiga Basic and, and and we played we played it and we refined it a bit. And then Mark Jenner, we had some 3D system that Mark used to generate uh, the graphics of the tiles tumbling down. 
and so he generated a bunch of graphics and then he went on vacation for about three weeks and when he came back I had got the game up and running on a, a escape uh, hardware system and, and people were lining up in the lab to play it. We were trying to minimize the hardware and have the least expensive hardware we could have. And our, the sound system at the time, we had an FM chip that did music and we had a synthesizer chip that did uh, uh, digitized effects. And so we decided we could have just one of those chips to make an affordable system. So we went with the synthesizer chip. And so we could have all kinds of digital sound effects, but no music. People would work out patterns on paper, uh, elaborate chain reactions and sub-chain reactions, and, and then they would patiently play the game and get, arrange all the tiles in that, in that pattern and make it happen. Mark wanted a golf-type sound, you know, like the little flight clapping and the sound of a golf crowd in there. So we, we kind of went around the halls and we got everybody we could and we put them into the uh, sound lab. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, were we had everybody clap like real wow. quietly, like golf, and then everybody oh. go. Oh. <laughs> and you can hear, you know, and, and basically that was those were the sounds. That's it. <laughs> and then I, I, I did the scream that ah that one that scream, and then there was I mean it, everything was very simple and quick, and you know there was not really it was really we didn't pay for a lot of uh, expensive voice <laughs> talent. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> The name Clax came from um, uh, the sound of the tiles. Click, click clack, clack, yeah. clax. Click, clack, click, clack, click, clack was the, the original idea for the sound of the tiles coming down. So we just shortened it from that. It was funny when the game went to Japan. They were concerned at the time because uh, the drug thing was just happening, and something called crack had just come out. And they were real confused when we sent them this game called Clax because they were concerned that it was crack that we were saying. <laughs> So that little interesting anecdote there, marketing problem they had, and so they, we had to make sure we definitely said, you know, winners don't do drugs or something in there for the Japanese market. It was, is this uh, the same people that brought us Puck Moon? Yes, Puck Moon. <laughs> These clacks, cracks. My contribution was this. I did 100% of the software. Uh, Brian and uh, Sharon came up with the original idea of Rampage as far as we want, it's like, what can we do as far as scrolling a background, using background animation as a building. They came up with the original idea and then we got together on stuff and we went from a two player monster breaking up the world to three. It was, a lot of it was to do with here you were, we were going to make you the biggest, baddest character on the screen and have all the good guys being the little uh, uh, people that you were destroying. It was a game of letting you do the destruction. And you'd be the bad guy for a change. You'd be the bad guy and have fun at it. Rampage was inspired, oddly enough, not by the subject matter as much as it was by a limitation of the hardware. Valley sent us to a trade show. We got to see what was going on out in the industry, and and some nifty things were happening out there. And one of the things myself and one of the art other artists, Sharon Perry, centered on was look at all this background scrolling, background animation, because um, the video games, sprite-based games, were at that time uh, just a foreground sprite, what's called a sprite element, and then the background. And our games didn't have any background animation, so we went back and say, hey, can't we do this? And we were told, no, we can't do this. So we went into a room. Well, first we said, why can't we? Well, our background is based on block boundaries. Everything's in rectangles. So we can't move that stuff in any, we can't move big portions of it. it we only had a little, limited amount of art. So the limitations, we went into a room and said, OK, what can we do that is moving in rectangles? And in the same conversation, in five minutes, a building smashing into itself is moving a small area of the screen in a rectangular form and that actually said okay then it's monsters it's you know knocking down a city this is going to be a riot
Rampage was fun. Rampage uh, was was one of these things that broke a lot of ground in a lot of different ways. It was we managed to squeeze an extra player on the cabinet, and that let the game at the time earn the distinction of being the highest earning game ever. Uh, so they wanted to do once it took off. They wanted you know, a lot of the trade magazines wanted to do. Uh, covers and stuff like that. So we actually built, we, we mocked up a scene where and got some, a dollhouse and busted a wall out of it and put some furniture uh, in there and I made a little styrofoam head and this was pushing through the wall so it was the cover of a magazine. We, with this, because the uh, rub with Rampage was you're destroying all these cities. There's 768 sit levels in the original game and like 125 different cities. We actually, uh, unbeknownst to management at the time, we sent out press releases to all the cities all over the world telling them that their town is about to be destroyed by three giant creatures. And amazingly, over 50 papers around the world picked up on it. And I mean, I mean, front page, front page articles telling them that, you know, you too can destroy Peoria for 25 cents. This was, the peripheral stuff is, is as much fun for me anyway, the stuff like this makes the industry fun, makes it fresh, makes every game fresh. The names for the characters were more just, you know, because they sounded funny. There was nothing about Lizzie, obviously, as a lizard, but, uh, and George sounded like what a big ape would sound like, and Ralph was almost an onomatopoeia. Is that right? Is it onomatopoeia? Anyway, George is almost a, an onomatopoeia for, you know, a dog or a wolf growling. So uh, the, the names just sprung up in conversation. They seemed natural. You've got a certain amount of time to do a game. We've got to be done with this in so long. There's a million things you always want to do, and it's, it's you, you come to the... Uh, uh, point where you've only got so much time left, so the feedback becomes real important. If people see that, yeah, I can punch this subway train and it goes back the other way, somebody stumbles onto the fact that, well, if you let me punch it again instead of destroying it, we've got a game within a game here. So it's accidental. Based on feedback, you enhance it instead of making it two hits to destroy it. Well, let's make it ten so they can knock it back and forth. Once the monsters shrunk, obviously they weren't wearing clothes when they were monsters, uh, they'd have to be nude down there. So I did a little nude picture of men and women covering their private parts, such as they were. And actually we had a fair amount of backlash over that. Here we've got something with, that you know, her hips are only three pixels wide, so I defy you to point anything out if you could find it, but we actually got some, you can't do that. These people, once they found out they were new, there was a backlash, but uh, it, was, it was more just, you know, talk. It, it didn't hurt us in any way. I guess the, um, yeah, really interesting thing in Robotron and Smash TV is you are confined to a single screen. And really in Robotron it was the easy thing to do with the technology at the time, and it, it turned out kind of interesting, and especially we actually chose that um, the dynamic there because the real the, the, the cool thing of that of that dynamic is it's a confinement, it's a sense of being trapped and surrounded with no escape. And that was kind of the, really the the cool thing in Smash TV is you're sitting seeing there, your whole world. You see you see everything out there that you have to kill, and then and then you, they're just converging on you from all sides, and you just have this feeling of entrapment and and it's collapse upon you, and you have to somehow flee, you know, work with the flow, somehow just blast your way through this mass and, and get out. And, and that dynamic, uh, you know, is, is really a lot of fun. And, and once you, if you opened it up and allowed the game to scroll in any direction, if you allowed, you know, um, a bigger, bigger play field, then it becomes, uh, you kind of lose that dynamic, because you can always just keep running. And here you must stand and fight, and 
and it's, it's a, the coolest thing is you think you're dead. I mean, there's times, there's so many times when you, 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 you almost, you can take your hands off the controls. You, you know, you, you go, oh man, I'm dead. And, and like, you're not dead. You go, whoa, and it's like, you keep, you keep killing, you know, keep fighting away. Mm -hmm. And like, you somehow come out of it and you go, man, I can't how, believe I survived. How did it survive? You know, just, you yeah, know, that's and, the key and, to, to all these, yeah. the, the successful games is that, um, you know, tight situations that you somehow escape from. Back in those days, you know, if you'd finish a game, like the Atari VCS games, if you finished the game, well, you know, you'd stop playing it. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to always put in some dramatic finale that's very difficult to attain. And so, you know, we put the keys out there, and unfortunately what would happen is people got so good at the game, they'd go through and they'd, they'd clear out the waves uh, more quickly than, than we'd anticipated. So the, the random icons that come out, and one of them is a random key, the key would come out, uh, it wouldn't come out as often because they were so good at the game. So they would get all the way through the game, not have enough keys to get into the pleasure domes. Have to go back and do it again. If you look at the Robotron and the Smash TV style of games, um, the, if you look at the amount of enemies that you deal with, on a per second basis, how many kills per second? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's ever been exceeded, or even come close to by any other game. Right. The amount of, of carnage. action, amount yeah, of the pure amount of carnage, carnage yeah. and action that yeah. that you have to deal with, and mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's amazing how you really have to have this mindset of you kind of have this global strategy of you know don't get too near the wall, don't right. get trapped in the corner. Right. But then you always have to have this free. You have to be always kind of free in your mind to give, to kind of take what the game gives you. Mm -hmm. You can't have like a predetermined course and say, okay, I'm going to go over here. It's and different this. every time. Yeah. It's different yeah. every time. Things appear randomly. Yeah. I remember uh, complaining to uh, uh, the the sound guy, the sound person on the game, that I couldn't hear. You know, uh, the, this guy exploding over in the corner, Mutoid Man, and not Mutoid Man, uh, Mr. Shrap Mr. Shrapnel, yeah. and. Um, <laughs> You know, he like threw up his arms. He said, "You know, are you crazy? You're you're throwing off 30 explosions a second. You know? <laughs> it's like, you know, how do you expect to hear Mr. Shrapnel explode when you know you're shooting 10 bullets a second and there's all these explosions happening and you're you know there's gunfire, blah 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 blah, and you know he's right. I mean, I you, know, you sit back and you listen to the game. It's like, wow, it is nonstop explosions. The first boss monster we did for uh, Smash TV was Mutoid Man, mm -hmm. and I remember, uh, you know, John just went into his office, and you know, he came back the next day, and he had these sketches of this guy in a tank, and actually wanted the guy floating a little bit at first, yeah. wanted him kind of flying around, and I was fearful of, you know, how I'd make a big thing float and fly around, so I said, well, what about tank tread, you know? And uh, so that's kind of how how we got into the business with with, with uh, Smash TV. interesting thing about Smash TV is that, um, you know, it's very violent. Uh, you know, the, the body chunks go flying in the air, you know, the, the pools of, of blood that come out of the boss monsters, the, the boss monsters losing arms and screaming, and, uh, you know, of course, a couple of years after Mortal Kombat came and there was the, the hoopla about violence in video games. Actually, when we first got that going, I mean, we just watched that for days. Yeah. You know, All just right. the, the blood pouring out of his neck. Right. I mean, it was like... Well, I remember, Eugene, uh, you know, one of the, the cool things about the, these early hardware platforms, um, for me, I, I had come from doing, you know, the Atari VCS games where the entire game was 4K. It would only take maybe six weeks to do these games, but um, very limited horsepower. And when I got to Midway, Williams at the time, and, and the hardware that these guys had developed, you know, sat on my, in my office. I mean, the, the number of objects I could toss out and balls bouncing around, I mean, I was just overwhelmed by it. So uh, when it came time to turn on, you know, some body, body parts or some chunks, I mean, just turn on two of them, well, that looks cool. Turn on five of them, well, that looks cooler. I remember Eugene, the first time he saw the, the blood coming out of the boss monster, he said, that's 50 bucks a week. My favorite gratuitous um piece of violence in uh, Smash TV is the eyeball. Oh, yeah. When, oh, yeah. when, you, when you step on that landmine, yeah. mm -hmm. 
Um, this incredibly, I mean, it's a total 3D rotation, coming into your face, right. animation of an eyeball. Yeah, sometimes more than and, one. Yeah, sometimes more than one. And, and I mean, John, I, I still can't believe it, but John drew that by hand, pixel by pixel, from his head. Mm -hmm. Nothing was right. rendered, nothing was, um, yeah, and, it's, and, and it's, yeah. it's growing in 3D, coming at your face. I mean, it, it, it's a total 3D effect. We're talking about doing a, a Smash TV sequel. I mean, you know, John came up with the idea of, okay, this game show and, you know, these people competing, and it, it really still applies to the, uh, today's marketplace, which is uh, competitive head-to-head -head activity, you know, in some kind of a, a creative world. Um, you know, I would love to do another dual joystick game. You know, I mean, that would be so cool. I mean, that, that's the, like, a great concept. Actually, there weren't a lot of waves. You know, it was, you know, doing a, a wave-based game. Yeah. I remember coming in and, you know, Eugene was thinking, well, I don't know what, you know, today's marketplace, you can get away with kind of a wave-based game. In fact, we argued about uh, uh, the free man icon, you know. Um, you know, of course, the games at that time had started to transition over to uh, buying in as you go. Um, right. You know, there had been some games prior that had, you know, allowed buy-ins. Tempest, I think, maybe right. was the first game that, that allowed that. But so... Um, Eugene and I argued because he thought, wow, you know, this, you know, I don't know if you should give away a free man. I mean, you know, we're buying in, let him continue, and, you know, let him go, and, uh, uh, which we have. So we have ended up giving away a free men based on score, right. and you yeah, could pick up the, you could pick up the icon. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we were a little concerned about a wave-based game, and, you know, of course, boss monsters would, would come in, and that kind of brought it, you know, into the current day, but... Yeah, it was, yeah, I think, you know, we buy adapting it to a buy-in format, mm -hmm. and there's always, you know, there's, there's always that, that chemistry between, you know, how far can you screw the player, and how much can you give the player, and how much can you screw him in, right. and you're trying to get money out of the player, you know, and so yeah, that there's, mm -hmm. that, there's that right. conflict there, and, and sure. I think the, 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 so I think about the buy-in, and the other big thing was the boss monster format, so basically right, taking your money, yeah. yeah I could do Smash TV from start to finish on one quarter, you know, which wasn't easy. I mean, to go through that game on just, you know, one start without any continues, I mean, you have to really, you know, be playing right, especially on the snakes. I mean, the snake uh, boss monster was the, uh, the last boss monster to go into the game. And, um, I, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, you have to lob the bombs at the heads and, you know, keep shooting them and they're coming down, they're dropping stuff on you. So, uh, you know, that's the, that's the toughest part of the game, but, I don't know, you know, good play mechanics can live forever. There was a movie uh, called Running Man with Arnold Schwarzenegger that must have come out around uh, 88, something like that, that um, kind of formed uh, some of the, you know, the elements of Smash TV as well. Um, of course, you know, we had two people out there competing just amongst themselves. It wasn't like the, the movie where, you know, they're prisoners and, and, and it's a death match. Yeah, and we, we, and we took it, I think we took it into a, the height of absurdity, you know. It, that, that was kind of the, the, the coolness of Smash TV was it, 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 it took this, this, you know, people are like dying and killing each other, you know, for like toasters. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right, and, right. And right. It's a futuristic game show. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in fact, yeah, that says yeah, the yeah, year yeah. is 1999, that's right? That's right. That's right. The number that's one right. rated that's TV show that's is right. Smash TV. That's right. right. And it's like the game, you know, the game host and... and uh, he was real campy. Yeah, yeah, just kind of like, he was kind of inspired by like some of Robocop stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, RoboCop kinda, like, was big then. You know, and and uh, just kind of it took this whole kind of satirical, comical edge on this whole thing. Right. That just, I'd buy just, that for a dollar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <don't think> so. <laughs> the reason why we made it a three-player game was simply we had four characters in the game, four carps, four drones, so to speak. If one player played the game by himself, obviously that was a shoot-in. You could have three computer control cars, and, and that's how you could control the pace of the race through those drones, as we called them. Two players was fine, even three players was fine. You always had that fourth player, or fourth character, to control the pace of the game. But we had a dilemma, and we were in a game design meeting with, with, the, with 
the management. If four players were playing the game, how in the world were we going to pace the game? We had no computer drone at that point. Cause we, we had no, had, you didn't have a clock running down. We had no down. clock, and so no. then we had, yeah, sorry. And the, uh, the other thing was trying to come up with a cabinet where you had the ability to, the, the, the key with sprints were the fact that you'd learn the angle of the approach and the speed of your car and you'd throw the wheel so that you'd slide around. That was what sprint was all about. So trying to, trying to get four players with enough room with a steering wheel so they could all view one monitor was and they'd, then they'd all be like rips. spinning wheels and smacking each other, which was really yeah. tough. So it was like, okay, three players is really good still. It's way more than one. <laughs> <laughs> the real reason, yeah, though, when, it, when it finally was decided to be a three-player game was simply because we had no way of knowing in game, from a game design standpoint how to pace a four-player game because there wasn't a clock in the game. And so magically we just said, oh, don't make it a four-player game. Make it a three-player game. We have the fourth drum. So what, what is our clock? Why didn't you put a clock in? Well, we talked about it, and we didn't want to. That would change the whole game design. Yeah. We wanted we wanted the uh, the coin drop to be governed by pure competitiveness, racing against other players. If you win the race, you continue on without paying. If you lose the race, you pay. And so that was uh, it. Just followed on the coattails of the success of Gauntlet, uh, being multiplayer. A lot of discussion given to to coin drop and how we can maximize that. I can think back to my super sprint development system and it was you know multi layers of boards, wires running everywhere. It only worked if I had a coffee cup, a styrofoam coffee cup that I'd wedged in between the first two boards because if they were any closer too much heat was being generated. And, you know Dave Wevenson Memorial Coffee Cup. What yeah, you say that's coffee? right. Yeah. That's exactly it was a technician yeah. on the project, Dave Wevenson. He, he made it all happen. <laughs> there were other technicians as yeah. well, but it, the development system were development systems back then weren't as, as elegant as they are now. <laughs> they were homemade. In Super Sprint, we tried to add a little bit of perspective to the tracks uh, over and above what had been done previously on the top-down views, and that is some of the turns on the tracks were banked. We tried to represent that graphically, and uh, we also represented that algorithmically in, in the driving algorithms, where if you went over a banked curved portion of the track, you had more traction as it was more than you need on the straightaway. So we tried to give it a little bit of a 3D feel, but it was purely 2D. And, and it was, I guess, the, a couple of years there, it was the last of the, of the 2D type. There was nothing realistic about the driving algorithm in Super Sprint, but that's what made it fun and challenging is, is the older game, Sprint, from the late 70s, used elements of, of the free spinning wheel as opposed to one that locks. And we wanted to even to enhance that further. So we changed the driving algorithm. It's drastically different than the original to emphasize the fact that you can spin the wheel. And that became the art of the game, learning how to, as I think Mike mentioned it earlier, learning how to spin that wheel right when you're coming into a turn and then catch the wheel as you're coming out of the turn as a way to play the game. That's a lot of the fun of the yeah, game. That was the, the fun of the game. That was the, end, the most interactive aspect of that game, just sitting there and just really spin, around to spin that wheel, slam spin it down the gas course. pedal, yeah. grab those wrenches. And let, me, <laughs> and let me make one other comment about, about Gauntlet, and that was uh, we saw the, uh, the benefit of, of maximizing coin drop by building up your character. And so well into the project, we had decided to assign different attributes to the cars, uh, being more traction, more acceleration, higher top speed. We took all of the, all of those attributes and made them a feature in the game. And that wasn't an original part of the design to do that. We didn't, we didn't have in, in our original document to build up your car over time. And so we, we put, introduced that into the game during, during the development. And, and that was a big part of the gameplay, the fact that in the arcades, kids could begin to play the game and, and, and begin to lose and start adding money. But over time, after they put in two or three bucks, they start to enhance the features of their car, which made them want to stay on the game even further because they didn't want to walk away from their car because it had, there were five levels of, of each of these car features, five levels of acceleration, five levels of traction, five levels of higher top speed. And so people wanted to stay on the game so they wouldn't lose their car.
I think the, the big inspiration for Tube and for me when I was first thinking of the idea is it was kind of a, uh, a reaction to the fighting genre of games that was going on at the time. And I saw a, an enormous amount of violent activity in, in video games at the time. And, I, and I, I swore to myself there must be a way to create a game that's fun to play and can be it can earn a lot of money, but can be good, clean fun for kids to play. Well, I think it was a good, it was a fun game, and, and a lot of people enjoyed it. But it doesn't, it still didn't have the appeal that the violent games had. It was, it's just amazing. It's, uh, it's very difficult to come up with a concept that you would think that people would have fun playing as in a sort of a strategic way, a kind of a, an, in, a, in a challenging way in terms of the control, to challenge yourself as a designer, to come up with the innovative new environments and approaches and um, and still um, the kids are drawn toward these these violent uh, these violent tendencies uh, later on I went to do primal rage which was a which was a big hit because it had a lot of blood in it. <laughs> so uh, you know it was it's, it's a reaction uh, to to kind of these these uh, these violent games and you I thought that there was a way to, that we could make a game that would be good clean fun for kids and and I think that uh, Tubin was a Definitely a cult hit. There, there was a good, you know, strong, you know, following of the players that would always play it and would always and loved it and would play it all the way through. Uh, all, but it didn't have the broad base appeal that the, that, the, that some of the other games did. We built a tile editor, and, and we had pieces of, of river, of rapids, of shoreline. And the designer would sit and click through tiles one at a time and basically lay them down right in the system and build himself a, a level and connect all the pieces, uh, kind of like magic squares, and you know, put it all together and, and uh, all of a sudden you have a level. And then you could go and you could add objects on top of that. You could add uh, snakes or alligators or cans. hippos and cans and you could just pop those in the play field at different spots and, and try the level on uh, almost immediately. If you go through and you destroy each individual piece of brush or thorns that are out there in the, in the, in the water, um, eventually what will pop up is one of the letters of Tubin will come out and it will float around. You can, go and, you can go and collect it. And so at the end of the game, you try to spell out Tubin in letters, uh, sort of as a, it's kind of a, you know, a, a game on top of a game. It's, it's, it's not necessary to do that, but it's... Uh, what was the reward for that? Um, Is there any? Well, no, yeah, it came out and spilled it out for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you got a lot of money, you got a lot of points. If you go slow on tube and the gator would come out. And he was called the gator for a reason. It's because he, he was put in there to pushing. keep pushing you ahead. It was just, again, tube was a waiting game. When you, when you, and, you, and we, we found that what players would do is they would just sit there and wait for just the right period of time and then really try to get through the gate or, or, or to go past an obstacle. And in order to kind of prod them a little bit, we put the gator out there. And uh, if you don't go through the gates, they'll come out and bite you and sort of prod you along and get you, get you going. So the, so the trick of tubing is to take a, take, a, take a nice pace and always go through the gates and he will, he will never bother you, ever. Novel things about Tubin is we did have we did have a pretty decent current map and depending on the animation of the water the water would actually pull you down at different rates depending upon the graphic that we were displaying underneath the uh, the character at the time too and I don't think that that kind of thing had been done previously especially now with water at least but uh, there's always been this aspect that uh, you have a game and you have a play you have a player and you have a play field and you have obstacles or enemies in the play field, but the play field itself doesn't really interact with you. It sort of sits there. And uh, this was kind of uh, a new approach to have the actual play field as part of the, uh, of the game as well, to, to get the actual background um, doing something to the player. It was the incredible <laughs> J11 chip. Oh yeah, uh, which was a deck-based uh, processor, 
PDP, PDP 11, 11 family, family chip, right? Down you, you, of that. you had that chip, didn't you? And um, we, we, uh, pro we programmed in a language called Bliss, yes. which was anything but. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, was quite a, it was quite a beast. Uh, 